Hi everyone, it's 6.31 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, November the 2nd, 2017, I guess. And I'm assuming that you are here because you want truth and I'm here to help, God willing. I'm going to pick up a bit uh, from where I left off in my last video, which was a bit of a commentary, of course, on what's happening in what's called the Flat Earth Community, social media Flat Earth Community. And I, of course, gave reasons for why I am uh, very much done with trying to read through um, authors like Hendrickson and Beaumont and many, many others. Of course, the only author I was even able to get through was Emmett Scott in A Guide to the Phantom Dark Age because in his book, his book was quite different than many others in the sense that I did not at any time in the course of reading his book detect any even small deception or guile to what he was presenting. He made his positions very clear, uh, his beliefs or lack thereof, uh, spiritually, and I found what he was doing um, quite easy to express and then to try to comprehend, even as complex as it was as a subject. I wasn't even able to get through J.A. Wiley's uh, paper, not even book, paper, the papacy is the Antichrist, because he started it out within the first few paragraphs with doing a clever twisting of words, I'm afraid. Um, over the last few years that I have been getting continually educated, one thing that pops out to me very quickly if somebody decides to try to use this tactic and they do. And for instance, um, what's his name? Kazawan from the tribe of Judah teaches or whatever. He would do this where he would uh, take words in a certain language and give you the definitions of them, but not tell you that those words that he was giving you definitions for or finding the etymology for were not actually equivalents of the root language that he was pulling from. It's deceptive. Um, and, and that is why with many, many people, and we're talking about a whole lot of theological commentators and writers, I cannot suffer their work because they do the very same thing. So, and you'll forgive me, I have a, a, an upper respiratory infection, um, and that seems to be uh, par for the course with a two-year-old who just uh, goes out into the world and uh, collects germs and then brings them home to fester. Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that. You might hear it in my breathing, uh, probably definitely in my voice, and the fact that my sinuses are blocked or half-blocked. But um, it, this does continue on a bit from the commentary I was making about the flat earth. The whole meme, uh, what, it's, what, it, what it's really become, what it could be, and what it uh, intentionally became by people who were uh, pushing certain memes and, and uh, models and I ideologies. And uh, these people all having this parallel um, memes, models, ideologies, um, all of them flipping. And you'll, you'll see the ones who haven't flipped will uh, gradually flip. And what I mean is, I pointed out the last time, the Jaron Campanella flip. Okay, and if you, you don't remember it, you can listen to the last video I just made. I expressed how he flipped, and, and that's what they do. That's what these people are doing. Whether or not they're paid agents, if they're not paid agents, then you know what? I guess they're just suckers because they're, they're pushing a bunch of lies and errors for free. So I guess they need to get um, better at their con or something if they're not getting paid for it. Uh, but, you know... Here's the thing. I, 
and I was considering this as I have been commenting in a number of different Flat Earth videos, ones that are, of course, focusing on uh, trying to uh, decipher whether or not certain people are uh, provable agents, and um, others that are simply just trying to expose certain false models and lies. And as I've, I've been commenting on these different videos, I've realized to myself some things that maybe some other people have realized far before me because, you know, they're probably smarter or pay more attention. But um, for one thing, why is it that with this um, recent flat earth movement and manifestation, which would be from early 2015, essentially, why is one of the biggest things they push, of course, Antarctica? Why do they keep pushing us out there like that, Antarctica? Do they keep doing that because they know that if they convince us that it is a round border consisting of these giant uh, sheer-faced ice walls and, and then it can be easily proven that, that it's not, of course, we look like a bunch of fools, crazy people, why do they keep doing it? And you know what? They're not alone. They're not the only people that are doing it. Trying to push us out to Antarctica. Keep our minds on Antarctica. And all of them have been doing it. Matt Boylan was doing it by trying to say he wanted to raise money so he could uh, do a journey across Antarctica. I mean, Mark Sargent was saying, you know, he had this idea of starting two boats in opposite directions and tracking how long or many miles it took for them to meet again around Antarctica. Um, when uh, Tiger Dan 925 decided to put together a map uh, by airport triangulation, uh, by the time he got to Antarctica, he, he acted like he had a complete flip out and was done with flat earth. To me, that seemed inorganic. Uh, and then afterwards, Jaron Campanella and a few others used it as a catalyst to bring people's attention more onto Antarctica. Antarctica has been one of the main focuses of this whole meme since early 2015, making us all but entirely forget about what is to the north of us. I think that's worth a great deal of consideration and thought. You can take a look at the history of uh, like who who was supposed to be the uh, the early people who um, made it to the North Pole and uh, a lot of shadiness behind that. And the funny thing was that not very long after that, um, uh, I at least America's major media and, and military industrial complex was doing the same thing that these faux flat earthers have been doing since 2015, pushing the attention of everyone out to Antarctica and off the Arctic. What is north of us? That's interesting. But I... I I'm not trying to spend all my time talking about the Antarctic. The other thing that, uh, like is with the Antarctic and other things that they pushed, actively pushed from the start in 2015 of the most recent manifestation of Flat Earth, led by controlled opposition, the other big thing that they pushed, and I hear people say this over and over again, I just heard David Weiss repeat it again in a hangout he was doing where he was uh, going on about um, how terrible the behavior of ODD and Jake Gibson have been lately. He repeated what I have heard these same folks repeat from the start, and that is this idea that it is... Flat Earth is the biggest conspiracy. It is the biggest conspiracy to hide our world for us, uh, from us, uh, to hide God from us, uh, to hide this and that and the other. And I would have to say that, of course, at first I was drawn into that because it, it of course seems to be the biggest conspiracy at first when you realize it because you have to... <laughs> You have to ask yourself, I mean, how were they able to pull the wool over our eyes like that? Um, 
Well, and the answer to that, it, it's not that hard. It wasn't that difficult to do. But as far as being the biggest conspiracy or the most important conspiracy, I would say that that is patently untrue. It is not true. I said quite some time ago when I was, I was getting sick and tired, um, even early on, because of, of, of all the nonsense. I mean, you would have Eric Dubé making videos that, you know, about Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer and, and, and others. And, and you would have other people make, making videos and comments, um, polarization nation against him and, and Matt Boylan. And there was all of this going on, you know, um, these people against each other. This person's a shell, that person's a shell. And, and I was getting really, really tired of it until I figured out, well, that's, that's the name of the game. What they do is if, if one person, if you, if you have two, uh, assets that are pushing a certain idea, uh, what you do is you, you take the wind out of the sails of the people who can really offer, uh, intelligent commentary concerning who these people may be. You take the wind out of their sails by having one asset call the other asset a shill, maybe offer some um, okay evidence of that. And then at the same time, you have that same asset that was called a shill. Call the first one a shill. And maybe maybe you get a third one involved that calls one or the other or both shills. What does that do? What does that accomplish? First off, what it does is it makes people choose a side. Well, one of them must be right, correct? And, of course, that's not the case. It's just a controlling dialectic tactic. Well, every single one of these people that have participated in all of this nonsense since early 2015 have all said the same thing that David Weiss did just recently, that this is the biggest conspiracy. Well, maybe in terms of sheer size that could be correct, but as far as importance... I would have to strongly disagree. I remember years ago when I was in a local uh, drug and alcohol court program. This was a very long time ago, actually. It was uh, 20, uh, 2009 to 2011. I participated in that. They forced me to go to counseling with uh, certain licensed counselors. And one of them explained to me that there were these, these big questions that everybody had to ask in life. Now, I found a page that actually has um, uh, these questions are pretty similar to, to what he told me. Um, he worded it a little bit different. And he had, um, he had one other one that was added probably to this. But these are the basics, okay? These questions, uh, the four basic questions of existence. And they are... Who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? How should we live? And uh, that counselor I had at the time added in, uh, with whom shall I travel? Okay, fair enough. Um, I would say that these four questions are extremely important questions. And I would also... Uh, pose to you that flat earth, whether the earth is, is uh, uh, a plane, albeit with uh, varied topography, of course, or whether or not it's moving, it cannot sufficiently begin to answer those main questions that are driving us or um, causing us to feel certain ways, um, it's not going to answer these, these huge questions. And if it cannot answer the biggest questions that people have on their mind, either consciously or subconsciously, then it can't be the biggest conspiracy. It can't be the biggest subject or issue. Other subjects have to be far bigger, far more relevant or important than whether or not the earth is a stationary plane. So whether or not the Earth is a stationary plane doesn't answer who we are. It can't begin to answer who we are. Whether or not the Earth is, is moving or is a ball or flat 
doesn't answer where we come from or where we're going. It doesn't answer how we should live. Now, I know all of these main voices from early 2015. They keep expressing or have expressed that they were they were atheists or agnostics and and this this revelation of the earth being stationary and a plane has changed their mind but of course they're not willing to commit to which god they believe in now and the thing is whether or not the earth is flat and stationary or a ball and spinning if you believe in an all-powerful God who could create a flat stationary plane as magnificent as this, then he is the same God who could create a spinning ball uh, with an infinite universe that is as equally magnificent. And the nature of the earth is still not going to answer these vital questions. It's really not going to tell us definitively who the enemy is. What exactly we're doing here. How we should live. Who we should travel with. Because just to observe the natural world around us, even though, as Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, that God has shown his invisible attributes to all his creatures in his creation. I agree. But that is in the natural creation, and he could do that whether it was a ball or a flat stationary plane. And no matter the, the, the nature of the earth, it can't begin to answer these very important questions. And I, I, don't, I, I don't think it matters who exactly you consult about what the truth is, and where we are, and who we are, and the significance of that, and why these things matter. They can't really give you the answers that are going to fulfill you if they can't answer some very basic questions. And a lot of people realize this as they float through different, whether it's conspiracy theories or just ideologies, philosophies, and religions. And that is why most people turn to religion, because in it, they, religions, attempt, as do philosophies often, attempt to answer these questions that the study of the physical world or universe quite simply can't. Out of all the religious, if you want to classify them as that way, the religious texts that do exist currently, not one of them can hold a candle to the depth of and scope of history of the textual peculiarities of in the sense of um, a homogenous voice throughout that the Bible can Absolutely not. If, if you want to make arguments against the Bible, great. But if you want to simply say in form of comparison what religious, if you want to call it that, text provides the richest sweeping cornucopia of information, historically, morally able to answer all these questions. Nothing 
holds a candle to what we call the Holy Bible, a compilement of books written and preserved throughout history. And concerning the books, we're going to discuss that too. But for right now, the Holy Bible, consisting of uh, the Hebrew Scriptures and what is argued the Greek New Testament Scriptures. So, understanding this and believing this, that only this book um, and those reading it and studying it uh, and thinking about it and meditating on it and examining it, uh, those people who are filled with the spirit of the living God, uh, moreover the spirit of his son that he sent to us, it's only in this context that anybody is going to be able to begin to fully answer these questions and start to understand who we are, where we came from, where we're going, how we should live. And I do think with whom we should travel is an important point in there. Now I said all of that to lead me back up to why I cannot continue to read these books that I've tried reading because I do believe that within them they contain uh, maybe a certain theory or theories that happen to be pretty pretty decent at the outset but of course they seem to always prove to be letdowns because they're either operating off of assumptions and passing them off as facts or like in the case of Commons Beaumont he's just outright intellectually dishonest I can't continue with these things because herein, anybody who heard me even try to get through um, William Hendrickson's More Than Conquerors could tell that I was having massive problems with his uh, theological, doctrinal uh, assumptions. He has applied a systematic theology, moreover a hermeneutic, to the text of both Hebrew scriptures and the, the Greek New Testament that then forces him to come to certain conclusions that I think are poor conclusions. They are conclusions that oftentimes make someone ignore certain other truths because they have to. They have to because their system dictates that they must do this. They have to choose either this or or that because they cannot um, they cannot appreciate both ideas because they certainly do seem to be contradictions. And of course, out of the leading critics of Bible text, both Old and New Testament, this is one of the um, this is one of the, the greatest charges that people oftentimes bring against the Bible is contradictory charges. Now, I have been looking at the text of the Bible for quite some time and trying to understand things like translations. Why are certain translations made in certain ways? Why do translators make certain translational decisions? And why do they express them to us in the way that they do? I began working on a book some time ago. I had a friend of the channel who had some time on her hands offer to edit what I was writing because I am very bad at editing and sometimes I don't stay on course very well. People that listen to me, they know that. So. I um, I began this, and I would send sections or chapters to her, and everything. They it started out well, and it was um, based on a theory that if we removed the obstructions that English translators were placing upon the Greek through punctuation and capitalization, that we could have a far better 
grasp of what was really being said, or at least how to interpret uh, a lot of these problemed passages. That worked out pretty good at first, until I got to a point where I started to realize I'm not going to be able to continue this commentary and theory on the New Testament and how we can better understand it through these methods that I was proposing without addressing a lot of the problems with not only the lack of continuity between the Old and New Testaments because of their difference in language and terminology, which is a big difference by the way, but also I realized that um, if I went back into the Old Testament and started turning over some rocks in that, that I would find not only the same problems, but problems much bigger. And I stopped that work, I stopped writing, and I hit this. And I found quickly after studying the Hebrew in the same way that I was looking at the Greek and trying to understand why translators did what they did and what they were pulling from, I discovered not only something called ancient Hebrew, which I've talked about before, which is actually quite different than what we're told today is Hebrew. What we're told today is Hebrew is not Hebrew. It is not only a very poor uh, shadow of what once was Hebrew, but it is a poor shadow of the original character along with a mass of confusing and deceptive commentary and changes to the text called the Masoretic Point System or Nikudot. That's one of the worst things that's ever been done to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. So when I set out to start understanding the ancient Hebrew character and to uh, refresh people's memories, and um, don't worry about that word on the screen, I'm going to get to that. Uh, to refresh people's memories, okay, so in uh, modern Jewish Syriac, and that's all it is, it is not Hebrew. Okay, that would be the first letter of their alphabet. But this, that I'm drawing for you right here, this would be the first character of ancient Hebrew and the ancient Hebrew alphabet. Now, why does that matter? Why would somebody study... Um, uh, the one, and um, I'm going to have to, uh, sorry, get to my keyboard here, um, because my keyboard doesn't work while I'm recording, so I need certain buttons that are available. On the keyboard of my, my laptop, because it has certain keys that don't work, so I have to keep it, um, somebody has the numbers locked. Come on. Sorry, I just have to, uh, I've got to release the numbers lock. All right, here we go. And this keyboard is, is different than, there, I did it. Anyways, so why would these things matter? Which is a good question. It's a very, very good question. Um, why does it matter if we study the ancient character as opposed to the modern Jewish character? Syriac character. The way that I can answer that question is by explaining something about English. I guess uh, an assumption to English and what makes English 
a terrible language. I, maybe there's better wording, but, but that's the wording I'm going to use right now. What makes it a terrible language? Okay. The word that I've written on the screen, uh, as you can see here, B-O-X, box. If I showed you this word and I asked you what it meant, what would be the source of knowledge and information that you would go to to determine what this word made of these three letters? meant would you go to the letters themselves to determine what this word meant and what it was what it was representing or would you have to turn to a source like Merriam Webster to find out what this means and everybody out there knows what the answer to that is. The answer is you'd have to go to an external source to this. You'd have to go to an external source to this word to determine its meaning. Now, the, the funny thing about that is, okay, and and don't think of this you know, please forgive me if I don't have a pen tool which makes it easier to draw, okay? I'm just drawing with my mouse. So I'm sorry if this isn't, um, you know, as, um, as easy to determine as if I had a pen tool and I could, you know, draw something. But, okay, I've just drawn something else on the screen there, and I'm sorry my drawing skills aren't very good. Uh, it was a not with a mouse, they're not. It was supposed to be a pine tree. <laughs> I know. Be forgiving. It looks like it could be a leaf, too. But here's the thing. When you look at this, you don't need Merriam-Webster to tell you what that is. Or, or its uses, or how it applies to you, where it comes from, anything like that. You can look at this and you can know, we're going to say that it is, it is in fact, we're going to say it is in fact a pine tree, okay, if it was a good enough picture to be one. You could say it is a pine tree. And you could, you could say a lot of things about it. Um, if I used, um, uh, uh, if I used a picture of um, of a pine tree or a, you know a conifer tree um, as well as a a picture of let's say we had uh, a standardized uh, picture that everybody knew and understood okay of let's say, of a, a bird. And I put those two pictures together, uh, and then the person viewing this would probably understand that I was talking about a bird that lived in a pine tree. Or maybe not. What I'm trying to do is tell you that if I put symbols in front of you, and you know what those symbols or icon mean, you don't have to go to an outside source like Merriam-Webster to understand what it means. You can extract meaning from that, from this, these two symbols. And I'm doing this off the cuff, folks. I'm sorry, I, I don't have uh, some kind of a great system put together, but I hope you can follow me on this. You can extract meaning from these symbols or these icons. You can extract no meaning from B-O-X. But what if, what if it were the case that the letter B, let's say, always meant, always had a, 
a, a hard concrete meaning of and I'm gonna have to write these out as I go so hopefully I can write these letters well as I go always had a, a concrete meaning of inside what if what if the letter O wasn't a letter but a character a character or an icon and let's say its meaning was typically empty or maybe hollow all right and then what if box or I'm sorry X uh, was an icon as well and it, its icon had a, a concrete meaning of let's say folded folded or to fold either way you would understand that it denoted something and now you looked and you knew that each one of these was an icon with it with its own meaning B meaning inside O empty X folded so that when you looked at this word you could understand by these characters because now they would be characters or icons what this word meant without Merriam-Webster and here's the thing nobody could come along and change the meaning because you would know what those characters or icons meant people couldn't fool with them and make you think that they meant something else now what if um, and I'm gonna try to select these and get rid of them so we can move on what if we had meanings to all the uh, letters of our English alphabet which would thus make them characters not letters and some people came along who really didn't like us who really only cared about themselves who were into keeping secrets keeping the truth and vital knowledge only to themselves and selling lies to everybody else but the insiders the initiates what if they came along and they said well these these characters here they don't really have intrinsic meaning they don't we know what they mean because we've uh, we've gotten it passed down from generation to generation by tradition and um, us people the uh, the experts in in words and writing we're the keepers of of that tradition and we can tell you that based on our tradition these here they're not characters they don't necessarily mean anything but uh, they just represent something when you put them together in the right way or a special way then then they can mean uh, 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 an empty hollow folded object a box we're gonna call it a box that's what it is and what we're gonna do in secret we're not gonna do this out in the open we're gonna take and we're gonna remove a whole lot of vowels that mean something and we're gonna replace them with a system could be marks underneath like this or like that or like that or like this we're gonna use accent marks like this 
accent marks over the words, in the words, and we're going to tell you that those are just telling you how to pronounce the word, how to stress the word. We're going to standardize this whole system. These, all these marks, all they're doing, they're just telling you how to pronounce it. Okay, this mark here, and I know for people who know Nicodote, they'll know that that's an ah sound. I get it, but stick with me. This is suspend, suspend your disbelief. We're going to say, okay, this mark here, it stands for the O. So even though this letter here was never in the original language, never there, this mark here was passed down by tradition orally. And all we've done is we've put a bunch of marks in that standardize the text and tell you this is the sound that should be in there. There isn't actually a, there isn't actually a character that goes in here, or a letter. It, it was always like this, and we've just had traditions passed down so that we know how to pronounce these things. And those same traditions, uh, they tell us what these words mean. Now, if somebody came along and did that to a language in which you knew that this character had a meaning, this character had a meaning, this character had a meaning, and they were concrete, and you knew by the way they were put together or their relationship to one another, that you could not finagle them into meaning something else. If a group of people took the most important text in the world and they hid it by taking away vital characters that mean something, that have bearing on a word and on a thought and on the whole entire text, they hid those things. And moreover, they added commentary to the entire text in a very subtle, nearly invisible way. And actually, it is visible because you can see the marks all over the text. You know, um, every time somebody wants to, um, say, look at whatever, um, the Hebrew text, let's say, and this is very disheartening for some people. Well, let's say uh, they go to the Hebrew text, and here is a very simple word, okay? But all of a sudden, okay, they've got... all this stuff all around it, and they go, oh my, I... um. Well, I mean, if I just look at, at these, I, you know, these seem pretty simple, but I've got, man, I've got all of these, and, oh, that's amazing. Well, what amazes me is this. Christians. Christians who, without a thought, will defer to the Masoretes text, the, the most um, popular one used as underlying text for nearly all the Bibles we have, and that absolutely, mo absolutely includes King James and most other modern English versions we have, they will defer to the Masoretic text, like the uh, Aleppo Codex. And they, they don't seem to equate or bring to mind the stern warning of Yahweh before Israel went into the land promised to them when he told them, do not add to this word. Do not take away from this word. He repeats it with Solomon. He repeats it with the apostle well, I don't know if it was the Apostle John or not. The Revelator, John. And in Revelation, it's even more stern than in Deuteronomy. It doesn't take much 
to see, to illustrate that the Masoretes who have uh, given to the world what is supposed to be the standard in Hebrew text took away from and added to the word. And I can illustrate this. You can find this for yourself very easily. So, I've been studying now the, the Nikodot, these uh, point systems applied to modern Jewish Syriac and passed off as Biblical Hebrew. And thus far, I have to conclude that it is some of the most redundant, oftentimes pointless nonsense that I've ever even heard of. Now, I said I was going to easily prove to you that they are not, they are not uh, transmitting to us the pure, unadulterated Old Testament texts. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to read for the most part two pages, one page from uh, the site ancienthebrew.org, Jeff Benner's site, and uh, the other is actually going to be from a WordPress article from the theorthodoxlife.wordpress.com. And uh, I think they're both going to illustrate to you I really hope in an absolute black and white stark way what the serious problem is with the Nikodot point system and uh, modern Jewish Syriac. And I hope at the end of it, the other thing it's going to do is show to you, the listener, uh, or give to you the, the hope and the uh, security. That our God, Yahweh, he has preserved his word. They've hidden it for a long time. And not like the uh, popular flat earth folks have kept saying over and over again, they're hiding God uh, by concealing flat earth. No, they're trying to hide God and not only God, they're trying to hide who we are and who they are by their perversion and manipulation of the text. And just the fact that these people were willing to do this and that many of them are willing to perpetuate it, continue it, should tell you uh, very starkly, instantly, that these people have no love of God and His Anointed One, Jesus Christ, no love for Him, thus no love for you. They should be absolutely avoided if they keep up this ruse, this sham, the real hiding of who God is, who we are, where we came from, where we're going. So I'll start with Jeff Benner's page, and I've said this before, and I don't keep saying it to be um, nasty. I don't trust all of his conclusions. Uh, I know he has said in the past that he doesn't believe all of his conclusions to be you know, 100% either. Um, I'm not saying I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt or not. I'm giving you information and telling you who it came from. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So um, this page is on the Isaiah Scroll and the Aleppo Codex. So on the screen, you'll see a section of the Isaiah Scroll amongst the uh, material of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and their origins, how they were found, whom by, and where they really come from. We're going to keep that on the back burner for now. Okay, This is a section of the Isaiah Scroll, which is part of a larger mass of scrolls and scrolls fragments and all that stuff, um, as part of a collection called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Benner says, the most famous of the Dead Sea Scrolls found within the Dead Sea Caves is the Quote, great Isaiah scroll, unquote. Now, here he has Dead Sea Scroll fragments on display, photograph courtesy of Berthold Werner. Uh, Benner goes on, while most of the scrolls are fragmented, deteriorating, or incomplete, the Isaiah scroll 
is the only complete scroll found within the Dead Sea Caves. And then he gives a picture of a Torah scroll. He goes on, uh, The life of a scroll depends on its handling and storage, but can be in use by a community for several hundred years. Some Torah scrolls still in use in synagogues today are over 500 years old. The Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Caves has been dated around 200 B.C. Isaiah wrote his original scroll around 700 B.C. and may have been in use up until around 200 B.C. This means that it is possible for the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Caves to be a copy made directly from Isaiah's original scroll. The Isaiah scroll, as well as many other scrolls and fragments from the Dead Sea, are currently stored and on display in Jerusalem at the Shrine of the Book. And uh, make no mistakes, folks, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were not controlled by, uh, in air quotes, the Jews from the start. They were controlled by the Dominicans. That is a sect of Catholic monks. Ah. <laughs> uh. Up until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest existing complete Hebrew Bible was the Aleppo Codex, one of the Masoretic texts, which was written in the 10th century AD, a thousand years after the Dead Sea Scrolls. For a century, this text has been the foundation for Jewish and Christian translators. The major difference between the Aleppo Codex and the Dead Sea Scrolls is the addition of the vowel pointings, called Nikudot in Hebrew, in the Aleppo Codex to the Hebrew words. These pointings provide the vowel sounds that are not present in the Hebrew language and were probably inserted into the text to standardize the pronunciation of the Hebrew words in the text. And what Benner just said there is a total assumption. He points out the name Israel in the Dead Sea Scroll to the left and in the Aleppo Codex to the right with its Nikudot. Now that's one example where the word in the original and the Aleppo Masoretic still have the same number of characters, not letters, characters. Uh, the name and it's, it would be in modern Jewish Syriac. The characters are called Yod, Shin, Resh, Aleph, Lamed, Yisrael. Is spelled in Hebrew with five letters. And he gives them, okay? It can be translated as Y-S-R-L. Only these five letters are used in the Dead Sea Scrolls to spell out the name Y-S-R-L. But in the Aleppo Codex, vowel pointings in the form of dots and dashes are placed above and below each letter to represent vowel sounds. I, A, and E providing the pronunciation, Yisrael. Again, there is no proof that those are the original sounds, okay? While the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scrolls were trans, uh, transcribed a thousand years apart, they are amazingly similar providing that the copying methods employed by the Jewish scribes over the centuries were very sophisticated and successful. However, there are some differences. Some are simple variations of a reading, while others are much more complex. Yeah, they're not... They're quite similar is, is really subjective, though, isn't it? That would be like saying... That would be like saying a, a Ferrari and a Dodge Daytona are quite similar. Mm -hmm. Besides the addition of the vowel pointings, other changes have occurred in the Hebrew text after making copies of copies. One of the more dramatic changes is the accidental removal of entire verses. And he goes into a portion of Psalm 145 from the Aleppo Codex. They completely leave out a verse. It is the verse starting with the character Nun, which actually this WordPress article will discuss that as well. So we don't need to here. But Benner goes on to point out these differences between the Isaiah scroll, which was written with just the pure character, 
and the Aleppo Codex, which has all of the absolutely confusing and what I believe, I'm starting to believe as I go, is actually an encoding of some sort that they put into the text, telling them which characters they removed and how they can properly interpret it while us goy are left confused about all of this. Now, what is interesting is after Benner says that they're quite similar, what I don't understand is he then compares here at the bottom the Isaiah scroll with the Aleppo Codex, and he says of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in question. Only. There's only 17 letters in question out of 166. You know what I would call that? I would call that a scribe who was wrong 10% of the time. Do you think 10% of the truth is not all that important? 10% of the truth can be the difference between the truth and error. And then he goes on. I'm not going to read all of his text. But he goes on to point out, look, right here, this is where it is. The text that's on my screen is just the portion. It's a portion, folks. 166 words in Isaiah 53. 17 letters in question. This is a portion. And he shows how many things are questionable. The letter Vav in Isaiah scroll is not in the Masoretic text. And he said, grammatical difference only. But here, I want you to go back to what I was just illustrating with you about the difference between a character and a letter. They're vast. And a character can mean a whole lot to a word. And that's the deception, folks. And that's the problem with something like English or what they've turned the Hebrew text into. They've turned it into something that they say is just made up of letters, and so many of them are inconsequential. Well, I find that and the attitude expressed here to be a bit hypocritical from somebody who has such an extensive sight and does, has done so much writing on the subject, who points out on this site how the original Hebrew was made up of characters that all had a meaning that still do have a meaning. And then to go on and say something like the letter Vav in the Isaiah scroll is not in the Masoretic text, but it's a grammatical difference only. Nonsense. Point two, the letter Vav in the Isaiah scroll, not in the Masoretic text, grammatical difference only. Nonsense. The letter Aleph in Isaiah scroll, not in the Masoretic text, grammatical difference only. Nonsense. Again, Vav, grammatical difference only. Nonsense. The letter Vav in Isaiah scroll, not in the Masoretic text, this word would be pronounced as To'ar in the Masoretic text, but in the Isaiah scroll, it is Te'or. But that doesn't matter, does it? Because when you reduce characters or icons with their own intrinsic meaning to letters with no meaning, then it doesn't mean anything. But every character used in Hebrew throughout the entire scriptures means something. Every letter means something. Yahshua said, not one jot not one stroke would pass from the law till all things be fulfilled. Because every jot and every stroke, and he wasn't talking about the Masoretes Nikudot, that didn't exist. He was talking about the characters. Because every one of them has meaning and brings meaning to not only the word, but the entire text. He goes on to point out all of these differences in such a short passage in one book of the Old Testament between what we've seen of original texting 
and I don't know why those were released. I've got a feeling. This is a, a theory. It's This is a theory, okay? Theory. The theory is that those scrolls, which make up what, what, what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were not found on accident by some unwitting Bedouin shepherd boy. They were found in 1947. The, 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 the criminal nation state of Israel needed some reason to go in there and start robbing and stealing and killing the, the indigenous population. And they needed one more thing to really push the uh, professed Christian community in the West into pecking them. And I think the Dead Sea Scrolls were one of the most key integral things that w were done uh, by this cartel to get the support of of uh, western christianity and i think they had to give up some some things that they've held in secret in private for a very long time because they knew that independent um scholars language experts paper experts papyri experts would want to eventually look at them they didn't let anybody get near them for a long time but they knew what's going to happen so they had to produce, they had to produce some of the most authentic stuff that they had, that they had kept hidden for a very long time to make this all look very authentic. You see, we found these in the, uh, the caves, uh, around the Dead Sea. They had to pick probably a very ideal spot where they could make the case that the environment around there would help to, uh, preserve them very well. You see, they gave up, I believe, some of the information uh, some of the material, the resources that they had had for a very long time to really push this idea of uh, a right to the state of Israel to go in there and do all of the horrible, evil things that they have done since 1948. And I'm only going back to 1948. But that is why I believe that we do have a certain amount of authentic texts within this uh, Dead Sea Scroll uh, fiasco whatever it was. Um, and I think just like with most of their wicked plans, like Joseph himself had expressed it to his brother, what you folks meant for evil, Yahweh's meant for good. You see, you people can't win. It's impossible. You cannot win. It doesn't matter how many of us you kill, silence, or do whatever your evil things to. You can't win. My advice to you, is repent now. Turn away from your evil. Turn. I hope you can, because you can't win. Now I'm going to go to this WordPress page uh, produced by a site called The Orthodox Life. It was posted on March 12, 2012. Now, this man begins with, I used to believe the Masoretic text was a perfect copy of the original Old Testament. I used to believe that the Masoretic text was how God divinely preserved the Hebrew scriptures throughout the ages. I was wrong. The oldest copies of the Masoretic text only date back to the 10th century, nearly a thousand years after the time of Christ. And these texts differ from the originals in many specific ways. The Masoretic text is named after the Masoretes, who were the scribes and Torah scholars who worked in the Middle East between the Guys, get this. Get this, guys. Torah scholars who worked in the Middle East between the 7th and 11th centuries. What a time, eh? Any of you who have paid attention to A Guide to the Phantom Dark Age or Illig, an actual historian, along with the Nemitz and Emmett Scott, actual historians, have produced a great deal of evidence that these centuries never existed. They were added to our calendars. Wouldn't you know it, the Masoretes uh, did their dirty deeds between the 7th and 11th centuries. And actually, many other sources say between the 7th and the 10th. Which, by the way, is the same period in time that Khazaria was a great superpower nation and did their whole conversion to Judaism. Wouldn't you know it? The same phantom years. That's amazing. The texts they received and the edits they provided ensured that the modern Jewish texts would manifest a notable departure from the original Hebrew scripture. 
Huh. Did you get that? The texts they received and edits they provided ensured that the modern Jewish texts would manifest a notable departure from the original Hebrew scriptures. Historic research reveals five significant ways in which the Masoretic text is different from the original Old Testament. Oh, by the way, Masoretic means tradition. That's what that word means, tradition. You know, somebody, somebody I know of said something like, um, you make the word of God to no effect by your tradition. I wonder who that could have been. I wonder who he was talking to. Hmm. So, historical research reveals five significant ways in which the Masoretic text is different from the original Old Testament. One, the Masoretes admitted, admitted that they received corrupt texts to begin with. Two, the Masoretic text is written with a radically different alphabet than the original. You better believe it is. Three, the Masoretes added vowel points, which did not exist in the original. And as we just saw on Jeff Benner's page, what they did oftentimes is remove vital, vital characters in the form of vowels and replace them with the Nicodote. So only they would actually know the meaning of those things. Nobody else would. Point four, the Masoretic text excluded several books from the Old Testament scriptures. That's right, folks. Those books were part of the scriptures when they did their dirty deeds, and they omitted them. You don't suppose they omitted them so that the full count of our scriptures would come up to 66 books, do you? Nah, <laughs> couldn't be. Part five, the Masoretic text includes changes to prophecy and doctrine. That's right. It really does. We're going to see that. We will consider each point in turn. Okay, first, receiving corrupted texts. Many people believe that the ancient Hebrew text of Scripture was divinely preserved for many centuries and was ultimately recorded in what we now call the Masoretic text. But what did the Masoretes themselves believe? Did they believe that they were perfectly preserving the ancient text? Did they even think that they had received the perfect text to begin with? History says, no. Scribal emendations, or Tikkun Sofirim, early rabbinic sources from around 200 CE, mention several passages of the scripture in which the conclusion is inevitable, that the ancient reading must have differed from that of the present text. Rabbi Simon ben Pazi, 3rd century, calls these readings emendations of the scribes, or Tikkun Soferim, Midrash Genesis Rabbah, and the Roman numerals, XLIX 7. <laughs> I'm not as fluent with Roman numerals to where I could just peel off what that number is. I apologize. Assuming that the scribes actually made the changes. This view was adopted by the later Midrash and by the majority of the Masoretes. In other words, the Masoretes themselves felt they had received a partly corrupted text, and they admit it. Big strike one, huh? Yeah, I think so. Uh, now I'm looking at the time, and uh, I've got a lot on my plate today. I do, or I'd continue, but I wanted to get this ball rolling because uh, I can't stress this strong enough how important this is. If there was a group of people that were able to hide who God really was, what he really said, where we really came from, um, where we're really going, what we're really supposed to be doing. Believe me, to me, it wouldn't matter if the earth was in the shape of a, a triangle or a, a square or a star. It wouldn't matter. I would want to know this first and foremost. Because this is where the truth really, really lies. 
consider this. And um, even a lot of the, uh, the modern rabbis and um, the people who call themselves messianics, and they, they still use, of course, the title rabbi, even though Yeshua told them, uh, don't call any man rabbi. you got one rabbi. That's him, Yahshua. He's our rabbi. He's our teacher. We're to be his disciples and to walk in the manner that he walked. He's also our high priest. He's our savior. He's our king. Yeah. Oh, anyways, you know, in the course of them um, teaching those, uh, those people that they, they pretty much... <laughs> They pretty much still look at as as the goyim. They do let certain things slip, of course. Uh, they do let certain uh, meanings that uh, they themselves, many of them, coming out of uh, rabbinic Talmudic Judaism, or appearing to, anyways, will let certain things slip, uh, certain things that aren't common knowledge. One thing in particular I read uh, from a rabbinic source recently that he teaches um, the Hebrew Nicodote system, uh, Hebrew for Christians. And, uh, oh, well, I won't comment too much on him or his system or the way he teaches or what he offers up, but something that he offered up, and I'm not sure that, that many people would put that into their context of overall knowledge and uh, keep it you know, lodged in the back of their brain to think on and consider and chew on because he was going into the, uh, the basic etymology of the word Hebrew. Where does Hebrew come from? Well, Hebrew actually comes from one of our very, very distant forefathers, Eber. Eber. Eber was one of the descendants of Shem. Um, things must have happened uh, that were very interesting in Eber's days and in his son Peleg's days because we can look at the deep meaning to both of their names. Peleg actually means to divide, but Eber, now here's what's interesting about Eber, folks. Eber doesn't just mean a language. The, the people that called our great, great, great ancestors Hebrews, they, they, weren't, they weren't meaning specifically a language necessarily, but Eber, or what I would pronounce by way of the ancient text and the way I believe it should be pronounced, Ober. Ober means to travel over. Now, that's what this rabbinic source told us. Well, where did he get that from? You see, the more we understand about the characters and the text itself, and by the way, this, this rabbinic source says, well, it, it was because... Um, they, they, they came from uh, across the Euphrates. He's got nothing to back that up, by the way, folks. But the thing is, what he didn't offer up is that we could take these words like Pilig and Ober and we could figure out from the characters themselves the concrete meanings of these words and begin to have a real understanding of what scriptures are saying to us who we are, where we came from, who Yahweh is, who Yahshua is. What is his purpose for us? Where are we going? Who's the enemy? Why are they doing what they're doing? All of these questions need to be answered, I believe, first in the Hebrew Scriptures, and then I think that it will be a piece of cake. I really do. Maybe not, but for the most part, to translate those ideas into what we have of the New Testament text and get a full, complete, well-rounded picture where we have understanding of all these things. So, flat earth, biggest deception? No, I don't think so. I don't think so, because this is a war for the mind and of ideas. And I believe this one 
its implications are far bigger. Personally and worldwide. Oh, I'm going to cut it off there and uh, I'm going to start back up with, with probably part two. And if I don't get through that, it'll part two of three. But uh, I'm going to start back here. Uh, on the next video and I'm going to complete this because I want to give you a very well-rounded idea of what is going on here with the language, what the Masoretes have done, um, the language as it exists, and what our potential is for knowing and understanding these truths, these age-old truths. So, I uh, thank you so much for joining me. I hope um, all of you who are here to to understand and to know the truth are, are greatly blessed and I hope you take this and that you bless others with all the knowledge that you have gotten for free I hope you bless others freely so uh, until next time I can't stress enough to love the truth and it will love you back take care <laughs>